Tak, budeme pomalu začínat. For you who do not speak Czech, please get headphones. You will definitely need them. Headphones are just just here behind the behind the three people who are going to speak in a while. Tak, vedle our guests are cheerful, obviously, that's great. So let, let's move this on stage and let's start. Before I give the floor to Ivo and our guests, I'd just like to welcome all of you to this last part of today's conference. To those who have spent the entire day with us, kudos and my deepest appreciation for being here with us. I think we are uh, probably not that attractive as uh, other parts of the program with films and moving pictures, but just like Michael Renoff said, uh, these conferences are much better um, than watching films. I will, after this blog, I will conclude the conference, uh, but now let's enjoy it. Ivo Bistrichan will be hosting the blog. He's also a documentary filmmaker himself, but he'll be hosting the debate for today. Can you hear me? Great, good evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks for holding this panel discussion and thanks for being here. I'm glad that you're interested in this topic. Ethics might be seen as uh, something that can be omitted, a thing uh, limited only to philosophers, um, entertainment for thinkers, something that uh, does not deserve attention of us practitioners. But since you're here, you know that it's not the case and that ethics play a uh, very important role in our work because it preserves our relationships. And we know all too well that relationships are the most important thing. This conference, um, it's already its second edition, which is great. Filmmakers are in a constant contact with people, just like teachers or doctors, and uh, as such, they influence uh, people, and they can influence them in a good or in a bad way. I'd like to welcome our three guests, two ladies and one gentleman. I'll start with... Uh, Anna, because she's the closest. Uh, Anna Krivenko, welcome to you. A filmmaker, graduate of the Audiovisual Studies Center at uh, FAMU in Prague. She originally comes from Kiev in Ukraine. She just recently presented her feature long, The Unknown Soldier. Neznami Voin. I sorry, I, I, I got the name of the documentary wrong, but it's Neznami Voin, indeed, the unknown soldier. It has received many accolades at a number of festivals across Europe. <laughs> then we have Adela Klečkova. And I have to read this, sorry. Uh, this introduction is quite... Uh, lengthy for me and difficult. I actually have to ask her because she's speci she, she specializes in cyber things that I do not understand really well. It's um, enigmatic to me, just like maths for many people. Adela studied uh, summa cum laude, which means that she graduated with honors at the Faculty of War Studies at King's College in London. Wow. She led a number of research projects focused on cyber projects. 
uh, for institutions such as NATO, but she's also head of uh, Digital Sherlocks, which is an open source platform of digital intelligence. And I could cite many more thing, many more institutions. She's been listed among the top 31 tech leaders under 35, 35 years, I suppose. And last but not least, but actually last, uh, last not le but not least, in my opinion, is just an empty, empty phrase. Because Zdeněk is our last guest indeed. Zdeněk Kalupka, director and cinematographer. For three years, Zdeněk worked with uh, Doctors Without Borders as a filmmaker. He participated in the Hate Free Culture government campaign. He visited a number of countries, including Ukraine or um, Asian, Central Asian countries such as Tajikistan, where he was participated in a project combating child tuberculosis. So we have a an interesting panel with a rich variety of professions and specializations, and we will use that to approach ethics in creating images of a world we live in, of a world that we take an active interest in. This debate takes place against the backdrop of a serious situation in the Middle East. At the beginning, we wanted to focus our attention on Ukraine. No one could have foreseen that the topic will gain even more relevance with uh, what's happening in the Middle East. That's, of course, hard to be happy about, but it's very relevant. I'm happy that we have filmmakers, we have an expert on wars and cyber systems in which current wars operate. And to begin with, I have a question to all of you. I'd like to know when was the last time you were faced with an ethical dilemma in your work? When was the last time it was difficult for you to decide? I can say it for myself. For me, it was last week. I was shooting in Děčín, I think, a small town in the north of country. I was with a lady whose brother allegedly died as a consequence of a police um, attack or intervention. The man was a drug addict and he died as a result of this intervention. This lady is currently dependent on social services and uh, she's help, She's being helped by volunteers who help her bring the case before the European Court of Human Rights. The intervention, the police intervention was shot on a video by some neighbors. The video is freely available. It's been seen by an, an, an enormous number of people around the globe. It went viral, especially within the Roma community, but it was uh, seen by other people too. So it really went viral. And based on this video, demonstrations and protests were organized in front of Czech embassies, um, 
in various foreign, co foreign countries. And I was faced with this dilemma because I was shooting a documentary about the region, uh, which has many problems, structural problems. And for me, it was difficult to decide whether I will include uh, the video as it depicts death of a person. I was trying to imagine what it would feel like for a spectator to see such a video. The video and its inclusion in the film can't be discussed with the person because the person died. But his existence didn't end with his death. It goes on with this video. I was taking into account a number of factors. Maybe I was um, I was almost um, creating a pro and cons list. And then I decided that I will not use it because we are already de dehumanizing Roma people and drug addicts by portraying them in similar situations because the person died on the street like a dog. So I felt that I will, excuse me, that I will include it to make people aware of how alarming it is. We seem that our world is a safe place, but it is definitely not the case for many people out there. So that's why I decided to show that, because we can be one day, we or our loved ones can be involved in such a situation one day. So that's my example. Now I'd like to hear from you. Whoever wants can take the floor. So how did you deal with it? In the end, in this documentary for the Czech television, I decided to use the footage and I didn't want to make it too prominent, so I edited it. It was more transparent so that it didn't show so many details, but at the same time it remained realistic. It showed the police car and the street and I just wanted to use this as evidence that such thing happened, but I didn't want to overstate it. To I just wanted to show that it is possible that a person is killed on the pavement, on the street in the Czech Republic with all the impact it had because the police denied any fault in this case. Okay, so I will follow uh, up with a less serious example. From my recent practice, I can mention two examples. Uh, I can mention uh, the Middle East and then Czechia. So let's start with this. Recently, I uh, started preparing an audio documentary on poisoning uh, prey birds in the Czech Republic, in the countryside, and it is also depicting the mentality or the mindset of people in the countryside. And uh, in all the time that uh, this poisoning has been going on, there was only one perpetrator who admitted his acts. And we wanted to absolutely interview him and learn why he did it. We visited him. Maybe it was not ethical, maybe not 100% uh, the way in which we found him, but we went to his place and we told him that we wanted to interview him about this topic, that we were really interested in his perspective. And the interview was really edging on a paranoia. This person was senile, he was very old, but at the same time he was clever enough to tell us at the end 
that if we use it at any moment in the future, he will sue us. So we have this interview, it was a 40-minute interview, and at the end there is this sentence. So what would you do in such a case? We found a way which might involve some uh, legal issues, but not ethical issues. What we did is that we only include our questions. So he comes in and he, we ask him all of these questions and we ask like, okay, so you had this carbofuran, uh, why did you use it? And I think that our questions uh, kind of suggest what he told us. And then we just kept the sentence uh, that he threatens us with suing us in the end. So we will see because the documentary is not out yet. We will see what uh, will happen. But for me, this is completely all right, because we wanted to include this. And this person, we also asked people in his village about him, and apparently he also didn't uh, behave nicely to others, not even under the previous regime. So there were several incidents, and it was really a no-brainer for us. If this was an isolated case and if we had other people poisoning birds that we could involve in this film, then okay, maybe we wouldn't involve this, but really we had nothing else, so we had to use this. And we will see what happens. I think that it already has had some nice reactions here. Unfortunately, I spoiled what will happen in the last uh, part of the whole series, but uh, do not miss all of the six parts in it. Maybe they are less entertaining, but uh, they will be really interesting. And I can also mention the other example from Tajikistan. I was shooting for Doctors Without Borders, and I just want to say that I'm not speaking on their behalf. They are very sensitive about this, so I do not work for them anymore and I am just speaking on my behalf. What happened in Tajikistan is that you have to sign uh, a document saying that you agree with the shooting if you are a patient. And they say that it is because they want to defend the interest of the patient in the first place. but. It is at odds with the reality of filmmaking because, for example, we had families uh, that we had identified, that we wanted to shoot, everything was agreed on, we had their signatures, we had 36 minutes of footage and, of course, it cost us money and we were about to edit this material. So we had all the licenses necessary, all the signatures, and then we sent this material to the editing room. And three months later, I learned that we had to redo it or we couldn't use it because one of the people involved decided that she didn't want us to use it anymore. So yes, she has the right to disagree, but I told her that this meant that we would uh, really, that this film would go to trash, that we couldn't use it anymore. In the end, I just edited the film and it is now shorter, but I think that it is uh, much worse because one character is missing, which was kind of complementing the topic it was dealing with. But regarding GDPR and uh, consent, uh, because we all have to agree when we are being uh, shot, so that's uh, enough for another debate and I won't go into much detail. But yes, in this case, uh, the patient had her way and she doesn't appear in the final film. I also have a story which could be a good uh, topic for another debate. I just want to say that I am sorry 
Uh, it's been a month uh, that I haven't been in Czechia, so I kind of take my time looking for Czech words. But anyway, uh, I did a project for an art gallery about uh, the neighborhood of Nusla in Prague. And I was looking for different materials and footage, historical materials, and I found a wonderful thing, which was an official YouTube channel of the Czech police, and they have excellent materials, for example, footage from accidents and so on. And I was looking for something which would take place in Nusla. I found two situations. The first one is the first scene, the framework of the whole film. And it is a moment of a suicide person uh, standing on the bridge of Nusle. Then comes uh, a police uh, car. The police try to dissuade the person from jumping from the bridge, but I think they do it in a terrible way. And then the film goes on and it ends with another scene when they manage to dissuade him. The person uh, kind of joins them and doesn't jump. So it is a positive ending, a happy ending. The footage is of poor quality, it is blurred, but it doesn't really matter. And uh, I used it in this film, I have it uh, on my profiles uh, online, and later I wanted to show an excerpt from this film of mine with, with two scenes, the first scene taking place on the bridge and then another one. But YouTube blocked this first scene. It said that if I had depression, uh, it was, uh, or it, they wrote me whether I had depression, that this material was problematic. Uh, I was expecting that they might block all of my content, but they didn't do it in the end. And it was very interesting for me because the whole film remained on YouTube, including the other scenes, uh, and also they uh, kept uh, the police channel scenes with the very same scene. So for me, this was an interesting question about propaganda, about the functioning of media, about uh, misrepresentation, about fake news. So all of these are huge issues. But the other issue is the level of control that social media have over the content. And now I'm not speaking about this suicide person and whether we need to see them, but it also concerns what is happening in Palestine, in Ukraine. Once content gets blocked by social media, it is a problem because such things are uh, somewhere. You shoot something, then you try to share it, but uh, it might not get to the audience. So this is a very interesting aspect, it seems to me, an ethical aspect, really about what control is carried out by the media. Okay, my turn. It seems that the mic works. Uh, Czech is my mother tongue in my case, but uh, it is difficult for me to speak Czech in public and I'm very nervous. Uh, I tend to use many uh, English words, so tell me if uh, I'm not doing well. I specialize in cyber conflicts, as was said by Ivo very eloquently at the beginning. And this is a vast topic. There are two subtopics. The first uh, are real cyber attacks on cyber infrastructure or hacking, if you will. And the second subtopic uh, are misinformation, uh, propaganda, fake news, and so on. We will probably speak in more detail about this later on. And this whole field is very complex and blurred, and you need to have a very strong moral compass if you are dealing with it, so that you don't get lost. And my last dilemma was, well, imagine 
a situation when you are carrying out uh, research about cyber criminals, people who perpetrate crimes not in the real physical world but in the online world. For example, they spread child pornography or they hack people on ethically they steal people on uh, steal money online and imagine that after one month that you have been working on this you managed to have a meeting with a criminal that is very important and you go to this meeting you don't know what to expect and the more you are listening to this person the worse you feel. You feel like you might want to vomit. This person uh, is in favor of Russia and uh, in times when uh, the whole world is trying to support Ukraine, this person is working for the enemy. And at this point you have three options. First, you frankly tell them what you think about them and leave. And months of your work are futile. Or, second, you just nod and do nothing and you risk that this person will not tell you anything about them. And the third option is to be very relativizing, to decide that not everything is black and white, that morals are subjective and ethics are subjective then, uh, okay, I have modeled this situation for you and I would like you to position yourselves in it and tell me what you would do. Okay, I'll tell you. If I were to have such a conversation with this person, I would let them speak and then I would decide in the editing room because I think it is um, impossible to consider ethics on the set. Thinking about this on the set, doing the interview and broaching subjects such as war, I think it would be impossible to take all the ethical implications into account. Academically speaking, I understand. Do, do not, please do not take my space. Just give me an answer to my question. Okay, so I will answer short, briefly. I would um, shoot the interview with him and then decide in the editing room. I think it is important to have your interviewees speak their mind. I think it's more important. It's the most important thing. And unfortunately, we can't hear the person speaking without the microphone. So it can't be translated. No. We hope it will be fixed for next uh, remarks and questions. And I think it will, so sorry for this pause. That's exactly what I did. I was super moral and I must say that it was incredibly intellectually and morally demanding for me. But I managed. I managed to go on listening and I received an I received invaluable information, so it was very successful. But I wasn't sure whether it was morally okay, whether I haven't compromised on my own set of moral values by listening in full to that very person. And yeah, we need the microphone. I'm not a professional journalist and uh, the person was there also from their own bill. So I don't think that this would be relevant to my case. 
Then I will give you one more example of such a dilemma with, with an open end. Imagine you have this friend, a leading researcher in disinformation and propaganda. This person is involved in this huge research project trying to unveil the identity of a big um, in disinformation um, sharer or person sharing this information. And this friend of yours is unable to trace this person back. So um, your friend runs out of possibilities. And the last possibility you have is to send an email with a backdoor in it, which is this small software that uh, makes it possible for you to access a part of the PC of the recipient of such an email. And imagine that this friend of yours approach you because you know people who can install uh, this backdoor and asks you actually to participate in this crime. Ethically speaking, it is good, but it's um, legally prohibited. So again, that's a huge question to do it or not to do it. I just uh, want to say <laughs> to Ivo that we we haven't uh, we haven't shared the microphone with our audience, uh, so we need to do that. Maybe repeat the question if the audience wants to react. Oh, all right. So. How would you react in such a situation? Imagine you know a hacker who can install this software. Ethically, it's OK, but it's uh, legally prohibited. Would it be for you OK to do it morally? Would it be legitimate morally? We do not have to answer that question. Let's have it um, as an open-ended question. And maybe I will give the mic to our host here. We talk about these topics in times of war, in times of wars that are very relevant to us, geographically speaking. For a long time, we've known that we are flooded with information and we've uh, discussed this phenomenon of information war. And for a long time, it seemed as a metaphor, as a metaphorical expression, because there was no war, no real war at our doorsteps. But with Ukraine, it's become real. We see how information is shared and how this directly influences the warfare and the, the the war itself. We see that it shapes uh, political decisions that then influence um, the decisions of uh, commanders on the front. So let's ask this question first. It's to all of you, but mostly to Adela. Do you believe that image is the most powerful tool in this information war? If we can compare it to a very powerful, say, um, bombing plane or very powerful weapon, so do you think that image is this um, is this powerful weapon of disinformation of disinformation war? war? 
because uh, traditionally image has been considered as a very important piece of evidence. Now we know that it can be misleading, that it can be faked, that it's controversial. We also finally realize that image is just a part of reality that um, can be cropped and um, used to serve certain certain purposes. So do you think that image is the strongest weapon of disinformation war? It was such a lengthy question that I forgot the beginning of it and I will probably end up answering something different. Anyway, I want to just say that us sitting here are biased because we probably believe that the media we work with is the primary one. You are filmmakers, so for you image would be the strongest weapon. I am with my background journalist, so I would say that written word is the key area. However, generally I think we can't say whether it's one or one media or another. It would be the mix of it. Video, image, text, everything. Everything that has flooded our cyberspace. But I believe that image is very relevant, especially in connection to memes. Memes, um, if you know them, these are these funny images with cute cats or animals uh, accompanied with a funny text. Say you would have a funny cat saying, uh, something, do not kill me, you need to send this uh, chain mail over to your friends or I will die. That's an example. Memes are a very important part of cyber war. They are not that complicated. They are not as complex as, a, say, research papers and articles. This is a very simple message, very simple image that can capture greater attention and gain much more traction in over in social media than other media. This is something that uh, I'm interested in. I believe that memes are the future of information war and it's been proven by what's happening in the current Ukrainian war. Memes are very strong. And then I would give the floor to my other co to other colleagues because I do not want to take all the space. I also want to listen to my colleagues here. But one last thing about videos. During the last presidential, during the last election campaign, we were faced with AI and with deep fake, which is generated by AI. Typically, imagine a video in which uh, people are manipulated into saying things that they have never said. And with the last election, I was expecting to see much more of it and to see much more sophisticated material. Mostly, however, they were chain emails, which are not to be taken lightly. They are quite dangerous, but we've been trained to detect them as uh, sources of disinformation and we can then work with uh, that realization. But I was surprised at seeing how how um, little sophisticated deep fake disinformation circulated on the web. We wouldn't have uh, President Pavel pictured in some embarrassing situations or videos where candidates would say things that they have never said. Some of them were created and circulated on the web, but not that much. And I want why. Why is that so? Is it maybe that it's enough to convince the target group with less sophisticated disinformation that the chain emails will do? Is it a matter of time? Maybe we will we should expect uh, more sophisticated deepfake 
during our next election campaign? It's just a question. I have no answer. I think it is very interesting, especially memes. Um, I commented on one meme and it backlashed horribly. Uh, can you tell us about the meme? Well, it was at this Facebook uh, funny page, Slušno Čech. Then this meme was about uh, this animal saving their cubs or little ones and comparing these animals to some Muslim people. And I just criticized the meme and uh, it backlashed uh, horribly. And I will never visit this page again. I was surprised to see such an Islamophobic uh, picture on, on this page. But back to deep fake. I'm also surprised that it's not that widely used. I've read an interesting article about how deep fake was used during the Slovak election campaign. It was not video, but it was audio in uh, Slovakia that uh, attacked the party of Martin Šimečka. It circulated on the very uh, day, on the day of election. It was very well thought through. It was quite sophisticated. And it played a role, especially in Slovakia, where on the election day itself about 20% of voters were undecided. But that being said, I think that deep fake is not necessary. You do not have to have sophisticated fake information because people can believe really stupid things. Anna knows uh, about that. Uh, there is this uh, legendary Ukrainian woman who's been through anything. Yeah, she's been through all sorts of uh, things in this so-called Nazi Ukraine. And, yeah, it, and it was obviously fake because it was the same lady over and over again and still people would buy that. So I think that deep fake would not change much because the target group is convinced already about their world view so they do not need that much sophistication. Of course, it has potential to mystify greater uh, greater number of people. OK, thanks. That could be interesting for my theory. But whereas uh, you can tell deep fake from reality right now, I think that in uh, the future, it will be so advanced, the AI models will be so advanced that you will not be able to distinguish the two. So you won't be able to tell what's true and what's not. Which doesn't mean that you will not have tools to find out what's fake, but it will be more and more difficult. I would go back to your question. Is image the most powerful tool we have? Our flagship, the flagship of the information war? I do not know. But it seems to me that for me the most important aspect, which is what I have seen uh, from my own experience when I read the news and so on, so the most important thing was the speed of an emotion that is awakened in me when I read a comment or a piece of news. This has been happening to me over the last week. For example, we find out that uh, there is a certain blurred photo and there is just a description saying what should be in this picture, for example, that there are children suffering and that it was censored by Instagram. And I immediately feel a certain emotion, which I think is the most powerful tool within 
the information works. It doesn't necessarily have to be an image. It can be done by text. And maybe I will serve as an example. Because when I work with found footage, for example, when I look at such things, I have spent nine years watching footage from uh, Ukraine. It's all started with Maidan. And for example, last year I did a film which turned out to be quite different uh, than what I originally wanted. But I was working with an analytical principle. I was using uh, footage from current wars, for example, from Ukraine. And I was using drone footage, which is again something new for me because there are more and more drone uh, footage materials right now. In my bubble, I constantly come across new and new material of this time. And we also have material from the cameras that are uh, worn by soldiers. So this seems almost like a video game. And I also can uh, understand what they are saying. I can see cities and uh, towns that I know. So it is completely absurd for me. I collected uh, these materials from drones, uh, but so in the case of drones, I know where and how it was shot, who shot it. But with the action cameras, it is much more difficult to find the source. For example, I know that sometimes I have to take a break uh, so that I do not uh, react too quickly because there are rules on how you work with such materials and how you work with potential misinformation. But it happened to me that I was watching a video and, okay, let's forget that I'm from Ukraine and I try to be objective, but of course emotions are constantly triggered in me. There were images of soldiers running somewhere and what I felt was, okay, I wanted them to win because they were killing the enemy which was actually a strange emotion for me to feel because I thought that I was a humanist, that the other side should also uh, be given compassion, although we are at war. So I don't know about this ethical aspect. I don't want to say that there is no ethical aspect, but it is much more complicated and much simpler at the same time. Because on the one hand, when the war started in Russia, there was this sentence that became a meme. Nothing is so simple, but I think that everything is simple. Everything is obvious. It's black and white. You know what's good and what's evil. I'm sorry, I'm making many parentheses, but OK, I was watching this video and later on I realized that these uh, materials uh, were shot by the Russian part of the conflict and then I felt very bad because I kind of didn't even have the time to analyze it all. I just was stuck with my emotions because, okay, we hear that everyone in Russia is stupid, they buy the propaganda, but when I work with such material, I am all also triggered very quickly. So this is the biggest strength of such material for me. Yes, that was a beautiful remark because, and I'm very grateful for this, you spoke about the power of emotions. The power of image is in that it awakens emotions that are very intense. So, yeah, I'm not sure whether we are speaking about bombers or about warships here, but the power is there. And if we look at memes and very short texts, this can be something that you just don't think about. You just feel emotions. You immediately uh, start uh, to feel hot and so on. I want to thank you for sharing your experience. I think this requires a lot of courage. <laughs> So thank you for this. And I also agree 
that image has a great potential to inspire emotions. I am looking at this from the other side. Most materials that I deal with are texts, and whenever I publish an interview, for example, I get death threats, and again, these are texts, because trolls don't like to send me videos for some reason, but they send me texts messages that are not really nice. So I need to process a lot of text and yeah, generally I do not get to process images. Okay, so they awake less emotions. You can try for yourself and uh, then uh, we will see if you feel emotional about these messages. Okay, this brings me, because Anna had a very interesting remark, uh, and we have two filmmakers here and one scientist. So I think when you work with found footage, probably a filmmaker should approach such material as a scientist. You try to prove or disprove a hypothesis. For example, uh, Anna, you said that you were watching uh, a video and you realized that it was created by the other side. So at this point, maybe we should approach it as scientists. We should try to keep falsifying everything. And if it cannot be falsified, then it's probably the truth that we hoped in. So couldn't we use scientific principles? and adapt them to our work, our approach to, sci uh, to found footage. <laughs> you can try and reflect on this aloud. I just want to say uh, that if he had a stupid question, I could answer something else. Maybe I will go for this now. This is a great opportunity. Okay, the floor is yours. No, I, I think I would just leave you with this question as is. Okay, so speaking about GDPR, okay, I will try to phrase it uh, in a better way. I will try to help you. I don't have two universities degrees like you, so you need to help me. Okay. You worked for Doctors Without Borders, but you don't work uh, for them anymore, so you are not speaking on their behalf. But in the last two weeks, there has been a debate on the events in the Middle East and also on the work of Doctors Without Borders in Gaza. To this day, this was a thing that was uncontroversial. And I would agree that uh, the conflict in Ukraine is completely black and white. It is obvious who is the invader and the invaded. So this cannot be legitimized in any way. But the situation between Israel and Palestine is more complex. Materials by Doctors Without Borders, who are there to help people, which of course is humane and non-controversial, but they have their materials, materials of the organization. And without them wanting it, this footage becomes uh, a part of the information war in this region. The conflict can remind us of other conflicts, but it is new in some ways. It has new parameters. And some things are hard to predict. For example, a photograph can be used in a completely different way than what it was originally 
meant for. For example, there was a picture of a hospital and there were different interpretations and the authors of this picture had to explain, but no one cared. This picture just served its purpose. It made it impossible for the public to agree on a single version of events. It is difficult for people to agree on anything, really, when you have multiple interpretations. So as long as we as documentary filmmakers, and maybe this was going on for too long a time, and uh, actually this is only the second edition of this uh, conference on ethics, because ethical dilemmas were always there, but we thought that when we make documentaries, we are good people. And I think that we just thought we were good people because we had good intentions and then the result would be good. We felt that there were no risks. But as you probably guess, it doesn't work like this. This is a completely erroneous idea. And the fact that you have a camera doesn't make you a better person. Of course, probably there are people who have better moral compasses than others, but not because they have cameras. And now the question, how do you think we should approach the creation of images and uh, statements and meanings? knowing how they can be misused and abused. So how should we take this knowledge into account when creating uh, images and uh, meanings? That's a multi-layered question and I will answer with a in a multi-layer way. From my experience, when I worked with Doctors Without Borders, the topic number one was uh, migration across the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, which was nothing, I mean, compared to what's happening in Gaza. And already back then, I was criticized by my friends that um, that Doctors Without Borders are not impartial, but that's. Um, very wrong to think because <laughs> Doctors Without Borders just witness things from a, a country they operate in. Now, currently, it's Gaza, so it's um, testimonies from Gaza. Um, but I think this is a really, really tricky, it's a slippery slope, and I can't uh, bring an answer to this question, especially in this particular conflict, which is extremely polarized. Uh, or say the uh, Karabakh uh, conflict that's been uh, forgotten. They have a very bad PR department. Exactly, you are right. They work with, um, with not enough uh, images. Yeah, so I have no, I have no sophisticated answer to this question, but I have a number of remarks and observations. I think that uh, this week, an analyst from Bellingcat talked on Vinohradská 12, this uh, podcast by the Czech radio. Uh, Bellingcat is a uh, watchdog organization that's pre that's proven a number of interesting facts relating to the Navalny uh, controversy and other things. And I think that still this analyst uh, said that uh, nobody knows, uh, that they can't prove who caused the hospital attack, while 99% of internet users had their opinion already well shaped. 
And that's how it works. People already have their opinion. It's either Gaza or Israel, depending on the people's world point. And Bellingcat can't change a thing about this. Only they will get criticized at the end of the day. Frankly, I don't know what to do about such polarized conflicts. I can't give you an answer to that, really. One more observation. I think that documentaries have one big advantage. In the Western world, there is this film, 20 Days in Mariupol. It's already in cinema halls um, by journalists of the AP agency. They lived over 20 days in Mariupol when under siege. And I feel that people tend to uh, forget uh, what was happening in Mariupol. This documentary, however, shows you this with uh, distance and that's different from news uh, news outlets and media outlet they have to cover events life with documentaries you can take some distance you can take time to process it and portray or depict the, the event that's why I like my work as a documentarist, because I don't have to do it live. So I hope it made sense, at least partially. Anna, what's your take on this? Well, hearing this, I realized that I'm sometimes really said how long it takes to finish a documentary with some topics um, they become irrelevant with COVID for example when it takes five years to shoot a documentary about COVID it, um, it loses its relevance and it makes me sad then you said that it is impossible sometimes to change people's opinion about certain things because their opinions are already ready-made such as with this example of this hospital attack in Gaza a week ago I spoke with a creator from Italy very clever lady since 2015 she's been cooperating with uh, Biennale in Kiev. She knows Kiev and the context in Kiev. And then she asked us about the shot plane. And she asked me if it wasn't Ukrainians, if it weren't Ukrainians, really. And I was shocked because this year it's been officially proved by the investigation which is over and i think that this information has been all over the place it must have been seen by everyone oh, that's what i thought such a simple thing and such a clear result and it was not communicated to even such a clever person I get it, of course, we are, we are submerged with information, with all the wars and everything, but this, that's why I think documentary is so precious, because it can archive stories that tend to be forgotten, because uh, people are flooded with flashes of information and flashes of images and they get lost in it and they forget. Now I have a question to Adela. We talk about how images are produced to serve as weapons in wars. We are bombed literally with fake images 
And if we perceive them as weapons, is there some defense? Can we defend ourselves against this? In the real world, when you're invaded, you can start shelling or you can start a counter-offensive. How to do this in the cyberspace? What is our tool of defending ourselves online? You ask me whether it's meaningful to fight fire with fire? Oh, not with fire necessarily, with water maybe? Well, if you want to put it that way, not necessarily with fire, but how? How can we fight this? How can we counterattack fake news? This is a very, very broad question. We have just 20 minutes left, so I'll boil it down to a number of conclusions. In one of my research projects, I focused on cyber activism, cyber elves mainly. We have a unit of Czech elves. Cyber activists are people, volunteers, who without pay, without being paid, focus on topics online, some fight for LGBT rights or animal rights. And I focused in my research project on this group of elves who fight against Russia and China and their disinformation campaigns. When I was working on this particular project, I also uh, reflected on, on this. I asked them about their weapons because I told them you are this group of volunteers who do this in their free time and you fight this uh, hegemon, this huge Russian machinery consisting of a thousand of well-paid trolls, full-time trolls, and they're not human beings only, they are also these AI generated tools, generative AI tools. So you fight against humans, but also robots and chatbots, thousands of accounts that are replicating orders or instructions given by, um, by these trolls. So isn't this a war that's already lost? And if so, would it be meaningful to you to use the same, to, to return the same attack? And they told me that their situation is far from being easy, but that you do not win wars using strong weapons, warships or bombers or hacking, that you win wars with stories. And that's the, that's, it's the stronger story that wins. And with cyber elves, the story is really powerful. Outsiders with very low chances to win, people who are so dedicated to their cause that they keep going, that they keep fighting against these hordes of horrible trolls trying to undermine our societies. Isn't that inspiring? Doesn't this invite all of us and encourage all of us to join their cause? I think it is. And it shows us that the stronger story wins. It's about being the good guy, not the bad guy. It's about being better than the bad guys. Yeah, there's one thing that I, uh, that I forgot, but a strong idea, old school idea maybe, but a very powerful one. 
and it's media education. We have to educate children about what fake news is, how to work with social idea, who trolls are. We have to keep talking about that and educating about that because it's become a part of our everyday life and we can't allow our children be faced with it without uh, without education, without proper education on these matters. We have to make sure that our children do not replicate the same mistakes. We have to do it in light of what's happening in Russia. Also, you can see that there is this propagandist uh, propaganda activities, children bearing automated weapons. That's absurd, but that's happening. I understand that parents in Russia are manipulated, but children too, they are getting manipulating because it's fun and it's so attractive. Uh, it's a way of um, forgetting about your homework and stuff. And we have to fight against this regularly, consistently, keep explaining and educating. We are not immune against propaganda, but let's make sure that the future generations are. Because fake news will transform and evolve and we have to educate about that. It will be an everyday part of their lives and we must make sure that children today will challenge any kind of information that gets to them from the very beginning. Analytical thinking, critical, critical thinking in terms of uh, media and media image. That's the key. I second that. I also want to share my optimistic view, if I may. I like this, op I like this optimistic wave, finally. Well, that surprises me. Oh, you will be surprised, but I will be optimistic now. Surveys show that it is not easy to influence people who already have taken their sides. So it is better to focus on people who are yet undecided. Petra Procházková recently said in Studio N that she thinks that the younger generation has a different approach and a more critical one to information. And I have a piece of information that I want to share for the recording of this debate. I read in, a, in an online group there was a person sharing pictures of models and uh, there were actually AI-generated models and someone told this person that uh, photographers would no longer have jobs because we can now generate pictures with models online. But when I started discussing this in more detail, uh, I felt that I would not lose my job as a director for cinematography and I asked others in what way AI could generate uh, reports and journalistic materials. And I was given no good answer. I think that using AI will be problematic for the audience. Amnesty International made an attempt at this uh, from a protest in Africa, I think. I'm not sure about the very state. Amnesty International tried to work with uh, artificially generated images and uh, it immediately backslashed. No one was happy about it and uh, they had to remove these pictures because people told them that, okay, you are supposed to show what is really happening and not to produce some artificial images. They said that they just didn't want to show the faces of the real victims, but everyone reproached this to them. I think that uh, in this flood of AI-generated images, people will actually get back to the good old sources. For example, right now, if I want to look something up, if I want to really know what's going on, I look for a trusted source. For example, I uh, can buy um, a magazine that I know is doing a lot of research. 
And I think that the same will hold for pictures, for example, agencies as Reuters or AFP will pay a lot of attention to that they do not use AI-generated images. Maybe I am being naive, but I think that the advent of artificial intelligence can actually make us look back at what is real and where to look for real pictures. So this was me being optimistic and uh, I'm handing over to you. Okay, I think this is the good moment uh, to uh, include our audience in this discussion. So if you have any remarks, impressions or questions, the floor is yours. Good evening. My name is Andrzej Kavan. The question of worship really resonated with me. Is image a worship or is it something else? Or does it play a decisive role? I think that at the beginning, we were focusing on what is happening to all of us here in the Czech Republic and also people in the West, in democratic societies, find themselves on the defense. In recent years, bigger misinformation campaigns started appearing. In the past, they were there, but they were not so well spread, not so big. I think the situation has changed quite a lot. And I think that we have the tendency to adopt the bottom-up approach. So we start to speak about what uh, really influences us, if it's uh, the image because we are filmmakers and we like videos, or whether we prefer texts, whether we keep reading things, uh, and uh, digging in texts. But I think that this is really at the bottom of it all. It's just a partial issue. It is important, but it is not the first order issue. I think we need to move several levels up. And I think that the decisive factor is that, okay, you have international actors and they can have power, they can have tools, they have the will to do something, they can target someone and they can come up with an intelligence strategy to do so. So there is this famous film, Vrtěti psem, which uh, is almost like a PRist agency or a PR agency uh, thinking about how to sell a certain washing powder or whatever product. You have these people who are very active. They are often uh, paid by states. But there were also simpler examples, for example, presidential debates in Czechia, because now we have a president that is elected by the citizens. And I remember a debate between Miloš Zeman and uh, Karol Schwarzenberg. And at one point, Miloš Zeman asked Schwarzenberg a question about uh, our uh, past, about uh, Germans uh, habit uh, living in Czechia, in the Sudet Sudetenland. And at this point, I felt that the person who is supposed to win the debate wins it not because they fight fire with fire on the same battlefield, but the winner is the person who manages to actually create the story, the framework and the battlefield in which they fight their opponent. Miloš Zeman managed to shift this war to a battlefield that he knew he would master. And then 
he could win because he was playing according to his own rules. And this is the same thing that happens in international relationships. It is often mostly done through soft power and sometimes accompanied by hard power. I think it is all about uh, strengthening the strengths of your model, of your approach, of your uh, conception of the world and living it. And using this soft power, you can then add some hard power and win. Because this gives you a lot of legitimacy. Do you agree with me? I will be glad to hear from you. Yes, so maybe you should be sitting here in my place because you have it all figured out. I think that you are right that the debate always or very often remain at the very bottom in the very last instance. And maybe the big questions are elsewhere. Maybe you are right or maybe it is all about the emotions. I don't know. I will give you an example to prove a theory that I know A person uh, uh, that I know uh, had a serious illness and then came COVID and uh, medical care was limited back then. His wife was afraid and then she became part of the anti-COVID groups. So she was against vaccination uh, and in uh, February 2022, uh, it uh, all evolved into anti-Ukrainian. So right now his wife is uh, going to anti-Ukrainian demonstrations. And this is something uh, really strange. Maybe there are also psychological parts to this. But I don't really know what I can do about this from my stance. Yes, uh, I agree with you. I think uh, uh, we should be reactive and not just passive. I think that this was a very interesting take. And yeah, as you say, we should be active before we are left passive. In the context or in the light of the current uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, we saw that uh, already very early on in uh, uh, the American newspapers that have a very big tradition of reporting on the events in the Middle East in the New York Times. And they, of course, are used to reporting about the Middle East. And uh, They were ready to report on such a situation, just like uh, journalists sometimes have uh, information prepared in case a president dies to write an obituary. So they were probably pre-prepared for such an event. And you could read about the roots of this conflict, about everything that led to this. And it was already one day after it all started and they could provide information shedding light on the whole context which of course cannot be done by a Czech journalist in Smichov. So it is about moving forward, about anticipating things, about being active you can speak about this uh, on Facebook, but also elsewhere. You can say who are the bad guys, but not only that. Uh, you can speak about what can be done. The most dangerous things happen because people are uninformed. But I agree with Anna that we have to start with young people who are ready to absorb information because the older people cannot be easily changed. I think there is 
room for creating a global sense of citizenship. We should try to raise our children uh, in a way uh, to raise awareness in them, to help them analyze the world and take a stance. This is an incredibly important skill, and it always was. Critical thinking has always been important from the start of humanity, of course. But right now, it is all the more important because of the current situation. I would like to disagree with you. I think that uh, uh, what this person said is that what the New York Times are doing is already too late in this view. Of course, I offer sources to uh, people I know who are anti-Ukraine and so on. I tell them, okay, I, I went to this uh, area, I spent five years there, and you can read from people who really know what is happening there, for example, Wojciech Bohac. But then this person tells me, I have my own opinion on that. I won't read this. I just want to finish. Please, let me finish. I really like this emotional aspect of it all, because before you or until you come up with an emotional story, no one will listen to you. Good evening. Thank you for this uh, very interesting exchange. I'll share with you a Slovak uh, example. We have a new government from Mordor. And I read this uh, post on social media. And the person said, I know that fits all lies. I believe him anyway. Full stop. That's it. No arguments. So it made me think. And I realized, how come that you, that you end up thinking like that? And I remember that I read about this feature, research, uh, representative research about how children like going to school in the OECD countries and the results left much to be desired in, in our countries because uh, our children suffer when going to school. And then another research, it's not a research, sorry, it's an insight or a remark um, that uh, sh with, that my friend psychologist shared with me. He is a counselor at the primary schools, and he realized that teenagers now are convinced that there is no such thing as love. And what I take out of it, so Fritzo lies, but I still believe him. That's something that begins, I think, with the dysfunctional families, dysfunctional schooling system, where there is no way out. I'm here destined to suffer. I believe there is no love. I believe, believe there is no justice. I'm lost. I have no sense of critical thinking. I'm terribly lost, but I need to believe somebody. So I end up feeling fit. So, so that's just my, my uh, insight. And thank you for this wonderful debate. Some more remarks. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I have to say it's such a relief. Um, to listen to this particular discussion, um, because the, I think from the, it, it's great that it's toward the end, that suddenly you know have this kind of uh, sparkling ideas, um, because I think previously I think those of you if you here, then we learned that you know, ethic is a, such a subjective approach. Some people think. If things is legal, it means it's ethical. Or some people would think that if something is illegal, 
actually could be ethical too, right? It's subjective. But I think through this discussion, um, it gives me so much hope, a lot of hope. And particularly is about documentary. Um, I think I very much agree with you. People have camera doesn't mean that they're good people. People who have camera doesn't mean that they're aware what they are doing. And I think that, that gives me so much hope about that. And the last comment is, as a documentary filmmaker, I think I also very much agree is about media literacy, um, media education, what is true, we're trying to get closer to the truth, but the fact that we're documentary, it means that we're also artists. However, in my view, I don't think art should be completely overcome and say, because of art, we have such freedom to do everything we want. Because otherwise, we can be just a painter. We don't need to be called ourselves documentary. And I think all of you give me so much hope that I understand that as a documentary means that we're artistic, we have artistic expression based on media literacy. Amen. Ivo, už asi čas. Thank you so much. Díky taky. And thank you all, thank you for coming, thank you for being here. Many thanks to Anna Grivenko, Adela Klečkova and Zdeněk. Thanks for being here with us. Zdeněk Halubka. Also want to uh, thank the organizers, Jan and Teresa, for holding this year's edition of the Conference on Ethics in Documentary Filmmaking. And I loved the final point, very poignant and very important. Because automatically we are not ethical in our activities. I think it would be quite the contrary on, in, in general. So we have to think hard about what we do. No automatisms are welcomed. And it's been suggested by all of our speakers. Time here is the key commodity. We need time to think about what we do. We need time to think about the repercussions of our decisions. We need time to take a breath and realize what we're doing without rushing and without following some learned automatic patterns, without following AI uh, patterns that uh, can make it much easier and faster. That should motivate us all the more to take it slower and think about how our activities influence human relationships. Thank you much. Thank you very much for talking about this topic. Enjoy the festival. There is much still to be enjoyed. I also want to thank Ivo because you thanked everyone except for yourself. I thank you, especially those who have been with us for the entire day. Thanks to Teresa, thanks to Veronica also, who's been behind the scenes of all this endeavor and it wouldn't be possible without her. And this is the uh, final, that's the credits of this uh, conference. And I'm really glad for the last remark from the audience because it brought us beautifully to the very beginning of this conference. Michael Renov showed us in his presentation quotes by John Grierson, somebody who's been at the emergence, who, who sparked the emergence of documentaries. But uh, his idea of uh, documentary as um, 
an educating tool is something that was rather challenged by our uh, following speakers. But we've ended up with seeing documentary as an important tool of educating. For Greece, if it was war, mainly for us, it's other topics. And I loved that we came back to the beginning of this conference because it's shown us how wide the range of documentary and its implications is. So thanks again. Enjoy the festival.